Hi everyone, and welcome back to the 41st video for the New Testament survey course. In this section, we'll look at the second epistle of John. As usual, we'll start by looking at the historical background of this letter. The author is traditionally thought to be John, one of the original twelve disciples. He does not name himself in this letter, but the content and style is very similar to John's Gospel and 1 John, and the ancient tradition is strong that John is the author. In this book, he called himself the Elder. Now, the recipients are likely a particular church under John's care around the city of Ephesus. In this book, the recipient is called the Elect Lady and Her Children. This could possibly refer to an individual woman and her family, but it's almost certainly a figurative designation of a local congregation based on the content. And the date of this book is similar to 1 John. It's unknown, but likely around 85 to 90 AD. And the occasion is likewise similar to 1 John. False teachers were around and trying to influence churches. This particular congregation was probably not yet affected, but John was anxious for them. And so the purpose was to be a proactive warning that false teachers were coming. John said, don't receive them, don't help them, and this is how you will know them. So John wanted them to be warned and prepared. Now let's look at the organization of 2 John. Because this book is so short, the outline is pretty simple. It starts with the standard epistle introduction, including a salutation, a typical blessing, and a thanksgiving. And then is the main body of the letter, which has three subsections. In the first subsection, John commanded love and obedience. He gave the command to love one another, and he defined love as obeying God's commands. Both of these are echoing commands from Jesus himself. We cannot separate love from obedience, as if either one is optional. And we show our love to God by trusting and obeying Him. In the next subsection, they were warned to beware of deceivers, because false teachers were active at that time. So John's readers were to watch out for them. And he described the false teachers. Everyone who goes beyond and does not abide in the teaching, the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. Those who reject or add on to the revealed doctrine of Jesus were to be suspected and rejected. But the one who remains in the teaching, the doctrine of Christ, this one has both the Father and the Son. The determining factor is whether someone remains faithful to the truth about Christ. If so, they know God. If not, they are a deceiver. Pretty simple. In the last subsection, John told them what to do if a deceiver approached them. He said, do not receive or help them, because whoever greets a false teacher partners with him in his evil works. And this book ends with a standard conclusion. John told of his intended visit to them and then gave a final greeting. That's the organization of this book. Now let's look at the content of 2 John by examining some key verses. First is verses 4 through 6, which say, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command as that you walk in love. In this passage, John expressed his joy that his readers were walking in the truth. The word walk, which John used, has the connotation of lifestyle, just like we saw in Paul and Peter. And this, he said, is what the Father commanded us. God has commanded the Christians have a lifestyle which conforms to the reality of who God is and what he's done. Then John re reinforced this by reminding them of the command to love one another which is the second part of the standard New Testament summary, how to walk in the truth. That is, love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus commanded the disciples, and by extension every Christian, that, that we're to love one another. But then John went on to further define what this love looks like. And he wrote, 
that love is walking in obedience to his commands. Again, referring to a lifestyle of obedience. This equating of love with obedience to God, it solves a huge problem in our current society. And that is that everyone agrees that we should love people, but very few people even think to carefully define what love means and what that looks like. And so, what some people call love looks a lot like apathy. And some use people as a hit and run charity opportunity to make themselves look good or feel good, and they call that love. And some people think, you know, loving your neighbor means sleeping with your neighbor's wife. There are many other inadequate ideas of what it means to love one another. But here, John does not allow us to self define what love is, because real love is defined by God. And to love in truth is to obey God's commands. Not only his command to love, but all his commands that teach us how to love and what love looks like. Because his command is that we walk in love. Next is verses 7 through 9, where John wrote, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. In this passage, John warned that there are deceivers in the world. When he said that they have gone out, he might have been referring to the people he mentioned in 1 John that left the church and were probably going around to other congregations in the region trying to find sympathizers. John said that one way to recognize them is that they deny Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Theological orthodoxy, right doctrine, just like in 1 John, is a key test of a true believer and a true church. And moving away from orthodoxy is a sure sign of a false believer and a false teacher. Now, what John said was referring to a heresy current in that time, which said that Jesus was not really human, but just a spirit disguised as a human, or just a spirit inhabiting a human body. But John insisted, as he had in 1 John, that the real incarnation is an absolutely necessary truth, and those who denied it were deceivers, were not from God. And John went so far as to call such a person an antichrist one who opposed Christ. And in the context of warning about deception, John encouraged them to hold on to what they had already attained so that they would keep their reward. There was a possibility that by giving in to the deceivers, they would lose ground and miss out on what God had for them. And then, God, uh, then John gave another way to recognize the deceiver, that they go beyond what was taught and do not remain in the teaching of Christ. Again, John stated the right doctrine, that orthodox theology is very important. False teachers want to go beyond the Bible, into uncharted territory, beyond the gospel. They're not content to remain with what is clearly taught. Now, it's my opinion that there's enough in the Bible to keep us busy for the next thousand lifetimes, and we don't need to go elsewhere. And throughout history, there has always been the temptation of the novel and the new. There have always been voices that advocate progressive ideas for the church to change with the times and cultural shifts. There's always been people who say, well, the Bible's sufficient for that, but not sufficient for this. Beware of those who call everything into question based on their experiences or emotional appeals of worst case scenarios. Beware of those who advocate for a new standard of judgment other than the scriptures. Historically, this has always ended badly for those who go there. And in this passage, John said such a person does not have God. But the better option is to faithfully continue in the teaching, to dive deeper into understanding, wisdom, and living out what God has clearly revealed is to have the Father and the Son. And that is the much better option, which we should wholeheartedly pursue.
Finally is verses 10 and 11, which say, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. In this passage, John commanded the readers to be cautious and to test if someone is, in fact, faithful to the teaching. And if they're not, John said not to welcome them or to support them in any way. Don't even allow them in. Don't give them a foothold or a starting point or a platform to work from. To do so, John said, would, to be, would be to partner with them in their wickedness. To give a horrible example, imagine there was some crazy-looking person carrying a bunch of weapons and wearing a suicide vest. If you open the gate and let that person into your community, you would share in the responsibility for any damage that they do. In the same way, John said, don't give opportunity for people who have shown themselves to be deceivers and false teachers. That seems like pretty reasonable advice. All right, those are the key verses of this book. Now let's examine the theological themes of 2 John. The first theme is truth. For John, Christ is the truth. Christ is the most fundamental reality, and everything that conforms to Christ corresponds to reality, to what is true and real. John loves the readers in the truth, and all who know the truth love in truth, and all who know the truth love because of the truth. And John took great joy when people walked in the truth, and that is contrasted with deceivers who deal in falsehood. Then the second theme is that to love is to obey. John defines love as walking in obedience to God's commands, and his command is to walk in love. Now, at first, that might sound like circular reasoning, but as we understand, it really is profound. By nature, we obey what we love, we pursue what we love, we conform to what we love, and we love what we obey. As we are conformed to the will of God, we grow in His love. And as we truly know and experience what real love is as defined by God, not by ourselves or our society, as we grow in His love, we delight to obey Him more and more. And the third theme is doctrine. Orthodox theology is a very important part of Christian life and health. John commanded the readers to hold on to the teaching they had received, and they were to avoid and reject those who avoid and reject the teaching. And those who go beyond the teaching and don't continue in the teaching, simply they are not from God. The doctrine is the knowledge portion of the truth we are to live in, and to go away from the doctrine is to go away from the truth and away from the love. It is impossible to really have genuine love and truth without loving the truth of the doctrine, without loving the teaching about Christ, because it tells us of Christ. And the last theme in 2 John is partnership. Now, this partnership can be for good or for bad. If we partner with good things, we do good. If we partner with bad things, with deceivers, we do bad and share in their deception. If we even receive a deceiver, we share in their wicked work, according to John. Therefore, we should choose carefully what we accept and what we support. We should not let people we care for be influenced by deceivers. These are the theological themes of 2 John. So now, let's review. The organization of 2 John is intro, body, and conclusion. And the themes of 2 John are truth, love equals obey, doctrine, and partnership. All right, that's all for the survey of 2 John. 2 John is certainly a short book compared with other New Testament epistles, but I believe it's not an inconsequential book that we can ignore. And I hope that you've learned and taken to heart the great insights from this book and we'll continue to think them through and put them into practice. In the next section, we'll look at John's next short but profound book, that is, 3 John. Thanks for watching.